Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, we have the new Canyons Drive. Oh, and the uh, Troy Lee D4 finally breaks cover. And some anniversary components from Nukeproof. <whistles> okay, so straight into news. And first up, there's a revamp or sort of a newer version of that Canyon Strive that I uh, think you used to have on, didn't you? Yeah, so the Strive comes in its CF, so carbon fiber, or the carbon fiber race. And it's the carbon fiber race that's had a bit of a revamp, similar that the newer one got a few months ago. Oh, so that's the basically the super high end oh, model. Yeah, yeah like a bit lighter. Professional issue version. Yeah. And what's really cool about this is, you know, a couple of years ago when bikes were 26 inch with maybe 130, 140 mil travel as a trail bike, mm -hmm. there would be the holy grail of 30 pounds. And it would be like, it's hit, it's hit the 30 pound mark. Yeah, it feels about right for that travel, yeah. I think, as well. Now, this is a 29er mm. with an auxiliary kind of slave unit shock, which we'll get onto in a moment. 150 mil travel, 170 mil fork. And with the XTR version in a medium, it can come in at 29.3 pounds. Ooh. Which is that's kind of a sweet spot. I know oh. you've always referenced that. You've never yeah. had a bike that sits in that kind never, of zone. I never really do. I always, I kind of just spec a bike with the components I want, and it always ends up heavier yeah. than I want it to be. But I don't really care. 32, 33, sort yeah. of. Yeah, I think mine have mostly been around that mm. area for the last few years. But yeah. it's funny. I tend to just think of, I just build the bike with what I wanted. I never want to. I never want to compromise on something like tires and stuff like that because. You do, it becomes very apparent when you haven't got the right kit on. Yeah. So I don't really go gram hunting, but it's just, I might, you know, hang my bike up just as a point of reference. Yeah. Although well, it doesn't really affect me, I guess. Although he says about gram hunting, but I did spy a set of the extremely lightweight cross country wheels on his bike outside. <laughs> he's kept quiet. Well, those are just yeah. bloody lovely, though, aren't they? You can't blame a guy. Those E13, I just stuck them on and. The new oh. super lightweight wheel. I'm yeah, sure yeah. we'll tell you more about those All in good time. maybe in next week's show. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the shapeshifter itself on the Canyon's Drive is something to talk about. So essentially, it's a, turns your bike into a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, like you said, a slave unit that goes on the shock. Now, actually, changes the upper pivot placement very slightly. So, changes the characteristics of the bike quite significantly. So, I think the BB height raises 4 mil, and I think you've already referenced it, it changes the travel very slightly. But yes. The actual suspension field changes as well. Yeah, I think if there's ever an education you wanted into how pivot placement can affect suspension performance, mm. ride the Strive in its two different modes. Small amount of change, but it reduces the travel to 135, and it really firms up and shores up the suspension field mm. by dra drastically increasing the amount of anti squat. So, although it's 135 mil travel, it pedals better than I'd say the geometry chart would suggest because. People look at it and they look at some bikes now with 78 degree seat tube angles. Yeah. And you think, oh, the, the Strive is a degree or two slack in that. But what is, it sits so high up in that 135 yeah. and so firm, it it's feels... It's a virtual feeling. Yeah, yeah. It, it's the effective seat tube angle when you're actually riding the bike is really quite amazing. And I'd strongly suggest... I, I think that's a really good shout. And that's, that's really sound advice from Henry there. Uh, the geometry chart isn't everything on a no. bike and people do get carried away. By all means, you can get a rough idea on how a bike might feel or might fit you, but the proof's always in the pudding. Yeah. So yeah, give them a try, and with that in mind, actually, how to feel two different bikes in one, uh, not just riding a strive there. Cool info. Okay, next up is finally the Troy Lee Designs D4 full-face helmet finally breaks cover. Uh, they sent us this video, which you're seeing on screen now. Um, it's kind of like a best of greatest hits. Yeah, edit, I mean, I got a bit teary. Yeah. It was quite emotional. A lot of Sam Hill in there. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's just such a the D2 and the D3 are just modern classics. Iconic helmets, they really are. Yeah. Well, even even the classic Daytona. Mm. I mean, they're super rare those things. But uh, yeah, beautiful looking helmets. Um, now, the eagle-eyed amongst you, I'm sure, might have already Googled this. And if you look on Google Images, you may well see some images of this helmet that's not currently released yet, uh, linking through to some shops. You can currently look at this helmet. And if you look in the description of those shops, it tells you that it's got MIPS in it straight out. So that's already an upgrade. And, that, and it's got the Techstream like, the carbon fiber shell on it. So that's quite yeah. advanced stuff, I think. They're going yeah. into a new realm of protection. Techstream as well are really kind of, they do aerospace, they also do things like the America's Cup sort of boats, loads of high level sport aerospace applications. It's really interesting to see Troy Lee, massive bicycle protection manufacturer, mm -hmm. teaming up with an industry leader. I'm yeah. very excited about this helmet. So uh, hopefully by the time you watch this video, the extended version by Clay Porter will be online and you'll know the full details of it, but uh, here's a few more clips for you.
as we mentioned earlier on, a bit of a year for Nuke Proof. 30 years. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? They're, yeah. uh, they're kind of that old already, but I guess it wasn't, it wasn't, well, actually, it wasn't that long ago. We were looking at that old retro bike they brought in. Yes, they had the true. original hubs, uh, the carbon shell, so that's really where they where the roots were. Yeah. Um, and now look where they are, they're back doing other components. Yeah, to and suddenly they're doing loads. Yes, well. doing loads. So they have their kind of horizon range, mm -hmm. um, and now they've got out the chain devices, which, if anything like the other component trees, I'm sure work really well. They've yeah. tested them with their EWS team, who have won, won a couple of things. They've, they've got the credentials. Yeah, yeah. they're for. They're, yeah. They're, Known on, known on the circuit, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it looks really cool. I think chain devices, they used to be you know, top and bottom, yeah. and then narrow wide came out and people moved away, but the security of a chain device is hard to beat. Well, that's what I, if I would rename them, I'd actually call them chain security now. Because yeah. it's kind of a just in case, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, totally. Because the narrow wide style chain rings do tend to work well, but you do need that little extra mm -hmm. sometimes when it's super rough or whatever happens. Yeah. So yeah, it's a tiny little upper guide there and a sort of a taco skid plate you tile. Mm. I guess you'd call it a skid plate. Bottom guide, just enough to sort of protect your BB and uh, more importantly, the chain ring from getting smashed in. Uh, as always, loads of colors and options. Yeah, look really, really good. And what else have they got? They've got some bars? Yeah, so I did have a little sneak peek at the bars at Core Bike Show, but now I've got the full details on them. Uh, they're available in alloy and in carbon. The alloys are 800 mil and they come in 12, 25, and 38 mil rise. The carbons also in the same rises, also in 800, but they also come in 780 as well. Right. Uh, they've got new cut markings on, they've got the, the paint with the particle stuff in it, it's yes. nice and grippy, so you don't have to over torque your controls to make them stay on there. And interestingly, the markings on the stem clamp are a bit wider because the horizons are quite wide and you see the stems yeah. just cover them up. And there's something, obviously bars are really personal. Yeah. I. You know, through this job, I've been lucky enough to ride the Nuke Proof bars, and they really suit my personal kind of shape of one. Mm. But they're doing something a bit differently with their offset design. Yeah, so I hadn't heard of this before. No. I, was like, I was like, how can you offset a pair of handlebars? But what they actually do is effectively roll in the bars forwards without ruining the sort of the back sweep or yep. the rake of the bar. So that is effectively rolled backwards. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like offsetting what you would naturally do with a bar. So you've still got the natural angle that your wrist is supposed to be at, yeah. but without reducing your effective reach yes. by stepping the whole thing forward slightly. Doesn't this come back to what we were mentioning earlier on? How important geometry charts are, yep. but there are so many different Too factors. many other factors, yeah. Yeah, people three mil of reach either way. Yeah. So much difference on the bar. Well, you think how high, high your stem is, effectively mm. the higher stem is, the shorter your reach gets. Yes, totally. So there's loads of small things like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a really nice little feature that they've got on them. Uh, the bars are supposed to be a lot stronger than before, they're lighter than before, mm. and there's more options. So oh. we win. Yeah, sounds pretty <laughs> good. <laughs> there was also the new range of headsets and bottom brackets. This is something they kind of, we saw released last year with their bearings. Yeah. Which were aided to stopping corrosion. That's right, right. yeah, yeah. Um, so they were using their physical vapor Deposition. Oh yeah. yeah. Which sounds, I don't really know what it means, but it sounds wonderful. Um, <laughs> basically, I mean, what it is, is they're basically coating the outside of the bearings in titanium, which actually I think probably has, well, obviously it's gonna inhibit corrosion, which is great. Absolutely, yeah, titanium bikes, in case you don't know, don't corrode. Yeah. That's why you can have bare metal bikes. And it, yeah, so it reduces, reduces corrosion. What, as a bike mechanic, you often have to do is when you know, you know maybe something could be vulnerable to it, is you put a bit more grease on there than perhaps you normally would, yep. which can attract more dirt, which can then give noise yep. and wear it out, exactly. So it's kind of tackling the problem straight to the source. Mm. So it seems, although I kind of was quite disparaging about the physical vapor deposition, it does <laughs> seem like a pretty good idea. Yeah, yeah, and uh, headsets as well. They've been, their bikes have come with headsets for a long time, own brand, but now they're releasing them. Um, they're kind of quite cool as well, because you can buy them in upper and lower units according to what you need for your bike. They're very well priced. Yeah. Um, oh, by the way, the bottom brackets retail around 60 quid in the UK, and the bars are 60 quid for alloy or 110 for the carbons. Yes. Um, the headsets are 19.99 for the bearing only, or the bottom and top cups are 29.99 each and there's a whole variety of different colours and sizes to suit virtually any bike. Yeah, fantastic. So. Really look forward to um, hopefully trying out those offset bars myself. Yeah, definitely. All right, now it's straight into Bike Cave. You know the drill. This is your garden shed. It's the under the stair cupboard. Uh, it's your basement. It's wherever you lock your bike up and keep it safe and work on it. Uh, get your entries in to the address at the bottom of the screen there. Take some photos or better still, take a little video clip, give us a little tour of your little place and uh, tell us all about yourselves and what you keep in there. Uh, first up this time is from Tim in Nelson, New Zealand. That's a very clean looking bike. Clean? It's even got carpet in there. Oh my goodness. I've 
I've had like gone to dentist appointment. It's been worse than it's, that. It's crazy, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's so, so cool. ugly. I've got to say, I love the checker plate to stop Ooh. you taking a paint off the wall where you're hanging the bikes vertically. That's a really nice little mm. touch. That that is nice. Um, it, it it basically looks like a kitchen that you've turned into a workshop. Yeah, and it's really light. I love that. Great lighting in mm. there. Yeah, we could do some tips for that in our new uh, workshop. I think. Yeah. Yeah, looking good. Although uh, the bike on the right, it's not quite hanging properly on there. What's that? Is that look twenty four? I can't really tell. From that angle, it looks like it could be a little kid's ripper. Yeah. Oh, it is, Marin Hawkill Junior 24. Oh, um, for your seven year old, rad. The riding in Nelson is just. It's really cool. Oh. Huh. It's too good. <laughs> Don't go. <laughs> Don't go. It's too nice. Oh, man. That's what I did my first season in New Zealand 2011. It was just amazing. Just amazing, you lucky devil. Okay, next up is uh, Paul in Idaho, USA. My adult daughter. Painted this for me in the garage. It's a scene from Moab, Utah. No, nice. Slick Rock, the classic trail. Oh, sick. No way. So you've basically got a mural on the wall, a pair of retro forks of some kind down there as well. Um, slick Rock, if, if no one's, if people out there haven't ridden it, I think it's a right passage. It may not be the best trail, but it's got a great story behind it and it's really good fun to ride anyway. Uh, crazy amounts of grip on that stuff. Oh, really? You know, it's called Slick Rock. The weird thing is, it's like the grippiest rock in the world. You actually tear nobbles off your tyre when you ride it. No. But apparently, it's called Slick Rock because um, people on horseback in the day when it was raining, the horseshoes couldn't grip oh. on it. It's just like ice, so that's how it earned its name. Um, apparently, so. Well, there we go. But uh, very cool. Nice bit of artwork, that. Yeah, really nice. Uh, this one looks a bit more like the sort of thing we're used to seeing. So, this Ooh, one's Somerset. from Matt Local and Somerset. Lab. Yeah. Um, putting the bikes on the wall and decorating my workbench area. I love watching GMB and Tech and relaxing around my bikes. Nice. There's a lot of uh, front covers of uh, Mountain Biking UK magazine on the wall there. Mm, yeah. A bit nice. of a fan. Can we spot the Doddy? Uh, I think these are, all, <laughs> these are all after my time, I think. Um, yeah, far, far better people on the covers by the looks of these. <laughs> he's got some brushes, he's got, I guess that's a bottle cage for some on duty hydration. Oh yeah, that's a good shout actually. Yeah. I've got one as for home a drill. Oh nice, a little holster. Yeah. yeah that's like a, a good, cowboy, but the good sweet. kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not like the Steve Jones cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about that video apparently. <laughs> it's done. And you're obviously into your fat biking as well, because I see a RRP fat guard there. Um, but nice little setup, liking your checker checkerboard, I was gonna say, your sterling board on the wall there. Gives it a bit of a warmer feel. Feels a bit like in here yeah, actually. Nice. I can see where you got the inspiration for that. Uh, good to see all your bikes hanging up nicely out of the way as well, giving yourself enough room to sort of move them around. Looking good. A bit of storage underneath your counter there. All your muck off products at the back and back left. Speak on the nice. on the bench. Yeah. Do you listen to music when you work on your bike? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I've got um, well, Spotify generally oh, nice. in the workshop. Yeah, I actually picked up uh, an old an old computer for 50 quid. Oh, nice. And uh, it's just about fast enough to, to manage the internet. So, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's my little, my little quiet space yeah, in see, there. I don't know if it's a sign of getting people. older, but I just pop on Radio 4. Do you? Yeah, Radio yeah. 4's right. And it'd be like yeah. Gardner's, Gardner's World or whatever, and I'm like, yeah. ooh, tell me about those orchids, Martha. It's I'm, absolutely great. I'm a bit of a Craig Charles fan on ooh. Six Music, actually. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> but we all have our little vices. <laughs> uh, great stuff, guys. Um, please continue to take pictures of your bike caves. We love them. Now it is time for my personal favourite. We have Top Mods. This is the part of the show where we can really show off, give some airtime to your bikes, your hard work. Now, it doesn't have to be anything crazy. You don't have to be stripping things down to their bare essentials. You can just be showing, you know, the little changes, some tan walls perhaps, new set of grips, that sort of thing. If you care about it and if it's your bike, it'll probably be good for the show. So please do send it in on the uploader below. And this one, this week, saying that is actually bloody cool. It is from, I'm gonna say An Ange? Angie. 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 And he's got one of these Merino bikes which originate from Peru. It is a steel, ultra progressive, big mountain enduro bike. So I'll see angle. I mean, yeah. it is just so cool. I love bikes like this. Yeah. I'm becoming a bit of a stickler for some super progressive bikes. So 63.5 degree head angle, which might make some of you go, ooh, ooh, ooh. But for me, I'm I'm just mm. enthralled. Yep. Single pivot, which can give you sometimes, if you put a good shock on there, it can be really, really, really cool. Super progressive angles, as Doddy said, the seat tube angle is up like an arrow. It's really, really impressive. 29 inch wheels, long travel. He's actually based in the French Alps. And I imagine this bike oh, would be fantastic. 
be absolutely a joy to ride. It looks really cool as well. Yeah. Real simple. I kind of like the steel look, the mm. slender tubes. Not dissimilar from Starling. Yeah, yeah, it is actually. It's very similar. Yeah. But he, um, he changed the travel on these Box 36 that he got second hand. Yeah. Just to bump it up, make it even more aggressive, should he need it. That long, I think it's 210 mil travel dropper post. And yeah, some hunt wheels to finish it off. And it does actually look really cool. Real head turner. 200 mil drop dropper post. I mean, man, like that's like perfect fit for his mm. inside leg to get that in there as well. Yeah. I think, do you know what I love about these single pivot bikes, be it orange, starling or something like this, is you, know, you get some bikes like, the, you know, something like the new Strive, which seems to be something like, you know, the Airy Latin track car? Yeah, I get Like, it. super high Loads set. going on. Yeah, and this is like a Caterham. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Or a Morgan. It's very a bit simplistic. More, yeah. Very simplistic, but all about, not necessarily the most, how much tech you can cram into it, but about sensation. Yep. You know, steel, single pivot. If you ride a bike like that's this, you'll That's a good analogy, I like that. Yeah, it's yeah, just, that's cool. that kind of, there's somebody, a, a man in a shed, a woman in a shed, just building interesting craft, crafted bikes. Yeah. I've just got a lot of time for that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Next up, what we got? Uh, this one, actually, this is really cool. When I first looked at this picture, I was like, blimey, there's a lot going on on there. So this is, uh, the first picture you see, this is Alexander from North Yorkshire. It says Giant Tarago. It uh, looks like a bit of a do-it-all commuter type yep. bike with a an enormous saddle on it. Um, a rear mud guard that um, even the EMBM boys would love. And just looks like a generic mountain bike, but had this a long time ago. So this was obviously someone's commuter bike, bought it for cheap, and then basically modded the bike up. And now, it looks like that. Oh, yes. It's literally, it's literally a completely different bike. Yeah, super cool. So everything about it looks different other than the main frame on there. So you've got on one by, got the SRAM stuff on there, yeah, NX Eagle, you've got a nice, short, aggressive stem and wide bar set up. Drop the post, a 150mm drop. It's like a brand new bike. Super cool. And that, that totally goes to show that you don't need to buy a new bike as well. Mm. Um, we're going to do something on how to buy a second-hand bike soon, and we're actually going to buy a second-hand bike and spend a couple of shows sort of renovating that bike and showing what you can do along these lines. But I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Alexander, of what you can do, buying a good run-around bike and turning it into your daily mountain bike. That yeah. looks awesome. I think it's really, really cool. Yeah. Got a lot of time for that. Yeah, definitely. Well done, dude. Okay, now it's time to talk about old stuff. This is uh, Rewind. We have a little look back at where some of the cool stuff in mountain biking started, where it came from. If you've got anything old, um, including yourselves, uh, any old mountain bikers, <laughs> uh, any old mountain biking kit, old photos of races, any of that stuff, um, take some pictures and send them in to us. We love seeing this stuff. <laughs> Maybe think, take pictures of old people and send them in. <laughs> as long as old people down with, the supermarket. With, with old bikes, that's fine. There was this old lady struggling <laughs> with the self-checkout, but I got a picture. She's got banging Trek Wise 33. <laughs> <laughs> Into Rewind. <laughs> yeah, so uh, first up this week is from Philip. Uh, he's in Lincolnshire. And he says, uh, my specialized has been featured before, but now it's nearly finished. The GT is finished, so you've got a few bikes going on here. A GT LTS3, that's the first one on the screen. Uh, I'm loving the old red, the BMX brakes actually, so they're, they're identical to the Dior brakes at the time uh, by Shimano, and they made the DX range, which was the BMX series. Uh, they're red basically, so it just looks a bit cooler. Uh, at the time, everything, everything downhill related was red, so the DX pedals were um, SPD pedals, and they were bright red as well. Very cool stuff. You've even got red rims on there, red cranks as well. Although you have got something that's just unforgivable as a rear shock, but I guess it's period. Um, a lump of elastomer rubber, basically. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, that's what, what rear shocks used to be. I thought it was a minion and like toy. <laughs> it does look a bit like a minion. Oh, well, well, yeah. I never. Well, it, to be honest, they were about as good as having a minion <laughs> as, as a rear shock. <laughs> like a Because uh, you'd go out on a cold day and you'd be like, oh, suspension feels a bit firm today. Mm. You'd go on a hot day and you'd be like, oh, off right. stuff. Um, completely inconsistent, however, they were super light, so. I can I just say how well lit this photo is? It's, it's very... It's really nice, isn't it? Yeah, like a yeah. film noir sort of vibe. I like it. Yeah, it's great. Uh, great iteration of the bike there. Classic four bar linkage design there. Um, I bet it still rides half good now, even with that shock on it, just because the pivot's all in the right place. Yeah. Um, and actually, those the good thing about elastomer and rubber shocks is they never rebounded too quick. You don't get a bit of friction damping built into mm. the material, so they, they kind of felt right in the right conditions, but um, over time they'd sag and would be too good. Another great That's picture, actually. Another. Yeah, very nice. Son of a gun, he's done it again. Very effective. So there, there's a rock hopper, so we have seen that before. I recognise the, the Bomber Z1 on it, the Azonic Shorty stem. Really cool to see. So you've got the head rims on there. 
That's kind of cool. And those unforgivable Panerasa tires with the red sidewalls on. That was a whole era of mountain biking that was just a bit weird. I think Hutchinson did ones with like a yellow band down the middle as well. Mm -hmm. It was like hard compound and harder compound. <laughs> Like back then. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully now the tyres are really good, like the soft compound and yeah. really decently made. But, um, but cool to see and nice to see them together. And very nice pictures, so thank mm. you for sending yeah, those. Thanks for taking some care of that one. Um, and this next one, I just got something about Cannondale's I've always quite liked. Um, this is Cannondale Jekyll. And the thing I particularly like about this, I'm sure you'll appreciate, yes. it's a trunnion mount on the rear shock. So a lot of people kind of just glossed over this when these bikes first came out. So a single pivot, but they got the geometry dialed on this and the back end felt really good. And you could adjust the basic position of the shock. So you'd adjust your head angle, seat, bottom bracket height by tuning the position of it. Yeah. Really cool system. And although those shocks were really short stroke, I think we just get overworked quite excessively. Yeah, yeah. Um, that actually felt really good. Yes. And he's got um, a great paint job in that as well. Still in it's crazy, yeah. And then, you know, I've always kind of loved the lefty. Yeah. It's not the best fork, but they're cool and they're kind of... All right, you, might, you guys might disagree with me. I well, think they're kind of cool. Yeah, and it depends on application, eh? On that bike, it just looks right looks because right. it's an obscure looking bike, the name's right, and that's what it did look like. Wow. So, so it's done a good job yeah. restoring it, really, by all accounts. But quite cool old bikes. Something about a Cannondale. That looks really, yeah. really cool. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for that little trip down memory lane, guys. Okay, now it's time for Tech of the Week. And this week is actually a bike I saw last week at Core Bike Show, but I was sworn to secrecy. Uh, this is it on screen, it's the new Pivot Switchblade. So it's a full carbon fiber build. This is the green version, which I, I think looks amazing. There's also a brighter blue version, if you fancy that. Uh, it's available for, well, it suits 29 and 27.5 plus size. Uh, 142 mil travel out back, 160 up front. and. This is the older version of the same model. Um, also looks really nice, but note the shock mount on the older model was along basically parallel to the top tube there. Uh, the new version, back to this one now, you can see it's a vertical position. So they've basically been able to take a bit of material off the front end, make it slightly lighter, because the tubes don't have to be strong enough to have a shock mount house on them as well. Uh, the vertical position makes the back end work a lot nicer. Also it allows room for a large size water bottle on all sizes, uh, which will definitely appeal to the sort of trail riders out there that don't want to be carrying big bags on shorter rides. It also means as well that they've been able to basically make it a proper one by specific platform. They've made the BB yoke really stiff down there. There's a load of shots firing up on the screen now that I took of this bike. Um, I think you'll agree with me, it looks really, really good. Now numbers on it, so the reach varies from 415 to 495 uh, or 410 to 490, depending on the high or low setting. And head angle is 66 to 66 and a half degrees, again, depending on the high or low setting. And the seat angle, uh, 75 and a half or 76. Now while 76 is nice and steep for a seat angle, Something that's important to say about this bike is it has the DW link. Now, that's a Dave Weagle link on the back. And one of the famous things that this does, especially in this incarnation of bike, is in the lower gears, when you pedal, it's got big anti-squat, so it really stands up. So essentially, your effective seat angle is even steeper because it doesn't sag as much when you're riding. So the dynamic position makes you feel like you're further forwards on the bike when you're climbing, which is exactly what you want. Um, again, some more shots of the bike. Uh, like I said, it's got that one by specific BB yoke available to suit both wheel sizes there. Um, and it's also coil shock compatible now. So the previous model was a bit of a problem because throwing back to that image again, uh, the clevis shock mount on it didn't really allow for it. Um, it's a bit of a pain, so it didn't work properly for that. And also the back end has a bit more progressive, so it does suit a coil shock if that's what you want to do. Uh, well, there you go, that's uh, Tech of the Week. Uh, there we go, there's another weekly GMBN Tech Show in the bag. Um, I'm gonna to throw to your video actually on how to make a cocktail that you definitely shouldn't drink uh, right down here. <laughs> It looks like a brain freeze or whatever it is, one of those weird drinks you get that looks like you've got brain inside. I wouldn't know what you're talking yeah, about. horrendous things. I mean, but it's a cool video. I, I like think you're talking about maybe J2Os, that's, that's all I'd know. Like yeah. <laughs> I'm going to throw down to the tyre comparison I did just at the weekend. Nice bit of fun. What is the real world difference between cross country and enduro tyres? Good there, I like the rolling resistance test on that. That shows you a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it really, crazy. really did. Yeah. It really did. But, uh, as always, don't forget to give us a thumbs up, guys. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments. Uh, hit the subscribe button and that bell. Cheers.